Good afternoon. I'm Paula Martell. I'm the Human Resources Manager for Northeastern Machine. It's my honor today to welcome you to the Partnerships for Advancing STEM Education. This is the fifth in a series of meetings that have been going on all of 2018. The focus has been to prepare students for STEM careers um, through access to uh, education either currently available or being developed. The network is funded by the Massachusetts Department of Higher Education STEM Pipe, Pipeline Fund, that's a mouthful, and is administered by CONNECT, which is the Southeastern Mass Higher Ed Partnership. The focus of today's event is to showcase the first STEM week held in Massachusetts in October, and to recognize the participants who planned and held events that week throughout Southeast Mass. We also wanted to allow those participants to show you what they did and to show you the impact that it's had in their community and how the educator business partnership can be replicated in your home community. As always, we're always hopeful that you find something at a table that you can take back and use or that you can make a connection that you can um, establish uh, some additional work with someone later. It has been the, my pleasure to co-chair this uh, event with my colleague and friend, Diane Ferreira. Diane is the Director of Human Resources at Accurounds in Avon. AccuRounds has been involved with the network since 2001, when the first partnership meeting was held at Patriot Place in Foxborough. Their involvement has included offering facility tours for students, educators, and community members throughout the years, and hosting work-based learning seminars for educators and participating in, of course, this year's STEM week. As a member of the Southeast Mass STEM Advisory Board, AccuRounds works with the network to increase the number of businesses that partner with educators. And they also brought Northeastern Machine to this same group five years ago. As a member of the advisory board, uh, both companies are working to increase the number of businesses willing to partner with educators. Northeastern Machine joined the network in 2013 we are an advanced manufacturer of precision machine parts. NEM is also a member of the advisory board and is a founding member of the Easton STEAM team, an education uh, collaborative between uh, the Easton public schools and businesses in the town of Easton. Along with co-chairing this planning committee for this event, Diane and I have also organized visits to manufacturers during another October event, Manufacturing Day and in Massachusetts Manufacturing Month. In the last five years, we have toured a number of students. This year, our numbers top 300 students and faculty from nine local high schools and two local universities and colleges who toured our facilities to learn about manufacturing in the 21st century and career opportunities open to STEM learners. We are grateful to the Baker Polito administration for its support of Manufacturing Month, the network, and the establishment of this STEM week. Their leadership shines a light in Massachusetts and across the country that there is a STEM gap, a need for employees with STEM skills that is greater than the pipeline feeding our businesses. Let me say a few words as introduction before I have the Lieutenant Governor come up to say a few words. Karen Polito is the 72nd Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts. She began her service in local government serving as a member of the Shrewsbury Board of Selectmen and then as a state representative for nine terms. Oh, I'm sorry, five terms. I'm giving you so much more credit. <laughs> Lieutenant Governor Polito chairs the Community Compact Cabinet, elevating the administration's partnership with local community governments and promoting best practices. 
As chair of the Seaport Economic Council, the Lieutenant Governor works with coastal communities to leverage their unique assets to um, drive sustainable growth in their communities. Lieutenant Governor Polito has also worked hard to promote jobs and economic development, especially encouraging young people to explore careers in STEM and technology and science. She is a co-chair of the STEM Advisory Council, working to ensure that all students have access to STEM careers with the goal of preparing them for careers and closing our skills gap. She works with educators, businesses, legislators, and community members to address this critical issue. She worked uh, while maintaining the interest of students presently pursuing STEM careers. She also works to increase the number of unrepresented groups, especially women and girls. The Lieutenant Governor has hosted the annual Women in Science Conference in Worcester. She is a board member of the Worcester Area Region Chamber of Commerce and the Corridor 9 Area Chamber of Commerce. Lieutenant Governor Polito is a lifelong resident of Shrewsbury, where she lives with her husband and two children. Please help me welcome Karen Polito. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. That's so nice of you. So good afternoon. This is awesome to see such a packed house here. And I just wanted to have the opportunity to come by and simply say thank you. Thank you for all being in this room. Thank you for what you're doing in this community to connect more of our students to your workplaces and to careers and opportunities that will bring more value, not only to the Commonwealth's economy, but to their lives. These are careers and jobs that are exciting and that pay good and that are really part of the innovation economy that's so special and so really unique here in the Commonwealth. So a few things just to get started. We've got some, some pretty heavy hitters in the room too in terms of our academic uh, leadership uh, with Bridgewater State University President uh, Fred Clark. Thank you for hosting us uh, once again today. Cape Cod Community College President John Cox is here. <laughs> Bristol Community College uh, President Laura Douglas is here. She's here. And uh, President, <laughs> President Spraga uh, is also here somewhere in the room. <laughs> and of course, uh, Admiral McDonald. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to see you. And Admiral McDonald from Mass Maritime. Awesome. And to, and to all of you, I just want to take a few minutes because this is your day and I know you want to hear from the panel and especially hear from Audrey who's had an experience in uh, the workplace and can speak to why this is important. I also want to speak uh, to why this is important. When uh, the governor and I were first elected now four years ago, uh, we knew that this workforce skills gap was a real challenge for us here in Massachusetts. And also knowing at the same time that we have this incredible economy, the, the most innovative economy in the country, that we really needed to figure out what the strategy and plan would be to, 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 to compress this skills gap. So we simply went out and asked you, the employers, what do you need us to do to help graduate students and also help retrain people who are currently in the workforce to develop the skills so that you can employ them and grow your enterprises? One of the things you said to us is put what's happening in the workplaces today into the classroom. So we've invested over $50 million replicating CNC machines and 3D printers and that kind of stuff right in the classroom. And that's done a few things. It's gotten our kids excited about working uh, through computer science, working on teams, problem solving, and developing skills that are so important to your workplaces. And they don't realize that they're developing these necessary skills because they're having fun. And then, we're able to work with our legislature to get another $50 million. So we have four more years now to continue to keep doing that because it's working. But we also heard from you and from our students, they want to get into your workplaces. So these internships, these paid high school internships are critical. We know all day long that apprenticeships, mentorships, 
internships, all of that works. So getting more of our students into your workplaces early on is critical. Not only for you as employers to sort of kick the tires around, does this person have what it takes to be part of our organization, but it allows the student to get a real life impression around work and a connection to a place where they can develop their skills and connect to careers and jobs right here in this community. Because I'm pretty particular about growing this talent in Massachusetts. Well, we gotta make sure we keep this talent in Massachusetts, and that's critical that they make the connections to you. Uh, we've also worked through the Department of Education. We have a number of leaders in the room here to strengthen the curriculum, making computer science a real option for students, the digital literacy standards, and then opening up, opening up a whole lot more opportunity to our teachers, to our faculty, to our superintendents to train uh, how to be good educators around the STEM subjects. And not only just in math and science, but STEM is in everything. So being able to embed STEM learning in all subjects is something that we're doing a whole lot more around. So today is my thanks around STEM week. We're doing all these incredible things, but we've never had a STEM week to showcase and spotlight and highlight the things that are happening in all of the regions of this Commonwealth. And as I understand it, we're the first state, I love being first on a lot of things, <laughs> first to have a STEM week. So we said, let's go for it, let's do it. So we started this back in like March or April, and you worked so fast and efficiently. We created over 500 of these kinds of spotlight events throughout the Commonwealth during that week. Pretty powerful stuff. So I just wanted to come and say thank you for, for helping us spotlight what's working in your community, for doing what you're doing, and that we need to do more of it, okay? Uh, so yes, we're going to have another STEM week and another and another and another, uh, but let's keep doing what we're to doing. And one of the things that I want to incorporate in my work, along with Jeffrey Lydon and Congressman Joe Kennedy, who are my co-chairs on the STEM Council, is to be intentional about recruiting more women uh, young women and more communities of color into the talent pipeline and the opportunity uh, pipeline that needs to exist here in this Commonwealth. So I know that you'll meet me in that challenge as we work uh, through our strategies for 2019 and just uh, simply thank you, keep doing what you're doing. It's really important, not only for the, the, the economy here in Massachusetts, but for the opportunities for people to engage in careers that are meaningful and that will pay more and bring more economic vitality to their individual lives and to their families. Uh, finally, just blessings for a great holiday as you come together with your friends and your families over the next few weeks and good health as we all turn into uh, 2019 in the new year. Thank you. So the Lieutenant Governor is going to pass out cita citations to the companies that participated in STEM week. First one, um, Amanda Loro is accepting for the Irvin Studley School, the Attleboro High School, Hyman Fine Elementary School, and Robert J. Coelho Middle School. Is she here? Is Amanda here? No. Okay, we'll put it aside. Um, Jonathan Carlson and Leslie Dunn will be accepting for Self-Help Canton Public Library, East Bridgewater Public Library, and Norfolk Public Library. Uh, Nikki Miles will be accepting for Cape Cod YMCA, Early Learning Child Care, and Educator and Provider Support. Okay. Um, I am going to accept for AccuRounds. <laughs> Okay. Uh, let's see. Amanda's not here, so I'm going to continue on. Okay, Crystal Brown is going to be accepting for the Attleboro Public Library. <laughs> 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 
Sylvia, uh, Sylvia, oh, wait a minute. Sylvia Michelle, Director of Vocational Programs, is accepting for the Blue Hills Regional Technical School. I don't know if she's here. Okay. We could save the applause maybe for the end so we can keep it going because the Lieutenant Governor's on a tight schedule. Uh, Jeannie, Jeannie uh, Eisenman is accepting for Bridgewater State University. Whoops, my. We're having a, we know we're having a. Hang on, let's catch up. Blue Hills, there we go. We're on Bridgewater. Bridgewater. Okay. <laughs> Sarman, uh, Saman, D, uh, the Dean of Mathematics, Science, and Engineering for Bristol Community College. Rodney Clark is accepting for Bristol Community College, Attleboro. Karen Grinnett uh, is accepting for Bristol Plymouth Regional Technical School. Monith from Brockton and NAACP. <laughs> Paul Engel from Brockton Public Library. <laughs> Hang on. Gotta wait your turn. <laughs> President John Cox from Cape Cod Community College. <laughs> Christy Caniz Canizio from Children's, uh, Children's Museum in Easton. They're not here. Kathleen Maloney from Derby Academy. Are they here? Okay, we'll just keep it going. Uh, Christine Pruitt, Assistant uh, Superintendent from the Eastern Public Schools for Eastern Community STEAM uh, Education Team. John Deli Prescoli from Edaville Family Theme Park. Okay, we could, um, Michelle Bradford from Enable. Sandra Chica from George H. Potter School. Darlise Montero from Global Learning Charter Public School. Okay, well, Joanne Sabriga from Greater Fall River Children's Museum. Chandra Oral from the Kaput Center for Research and Innovation in STEM Education. They're not, they're not here. Eval Silvera from Code Connect and George School. Admiral Fran McDonald from Mass Maritime Academy. Oh. Oh. <laughs> 
Is this Kathy? Kathy, this is Kathy Driscoll, I believe. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Deborah Fournier from Mansfield High School. Janet Moy from Millstone Medical Outsourcing. John Holbrook and Paul Diamond from Northeastern Machine. Christy loved the good photo. Aaron Polinski from Old Colony Regional. I mean, they're not here. Diane Bardsley and Deborah Garvin from Robin's Children's Program. Sorry, there's a few people not here. Miranda Bethune from Science from Scientists. Catherine Honey and Stacy Kaminsky from Southeast STEM Network. Yay! Yay. Woohoo! <laughs> 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 Alexia Texacaros, uh, president of Sensata. Scott Farrell from Silver Lake Regional, and Joy Blackwood. <laughs> Chelsea Lawrence in Richmond from Sipican School. Joe Ramos from Somerset, Berkeley. Ram Bala from UMass Dartmouth. Janice Barton and Sue Tabor from Wareham Middle School. They made their own cranberry. so great. 
Nanette Ryan from West Bridgewater Public Library. Don't know if she's here. And I think that's all we have. Um, for all the recipients of all, what? No? Oh, Weymouth is here. Weymouth. Oh, how did I forget you guys? Wait a minute, let me turn the last page. Oh, you're on the last page, the last one, sorry. I'm sorry, Ron Ho from the Weymouth Public Schools. I'm sorry. <laughs> If all the people that won the, uh, that received a citation could come up to the front because they would like to take a group photo of everyone. Um, we're just gonna be tight, so we're gonna kind of rally, we don't need one? Oh, okay. You sure? Okay. Never mind, change of plans. <laughs> okay, thank you, and thank you to, to the Lieutenant Governor. Do you have to say Thank you. Keith, I think Keith's up now. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, they're here. Tori. Okay. Oh, sorry. Say Gordon Mitchell oh, yeah, no, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tori from the Gordon Mitchell School is here. Sorry. Which one from? Oh, okay. No, that's okay. And we, we also have another, we have a late arrival, but they're here. From the Global Learning Charter uh, Public School, we have Darlise Montero. Thank you. As I said, my name is Keith Connors. I'm happy to be here. In fact, I was so excited to come today that I ran out of the office in Boston and forgot my uh, sports jacket. But uh, nonetheless, at least no one important was here, like the lieutenant governor or college presidents or anything like that. So I feel relaxed and good about that. Um, so what a great week we had in um, October, huh, STEM week? Woohoo! First STEM week. And I have to say, so in my role as the STEM network uh, manager, one of the um, honors that I have is going around the state to the different uh, regional STEM networks. And the Southeast STEM network is really quite impressive in our body of about nine networks uh, from the Cape all the way to Western Mass. So really impressive job as we saw by the number of folks that came up here to accept awards because of the many activities. You know, it's interesting that um, when we, when the Executive Office of Education and the Governor's um, Administration conceived of STEM Week, they thought, geez, it would be nice if maybe there was one activity on each uh, regional network per day. And of course, as you all know, you have so much going on every day in the STEM uh, area, in your workplaces, in your schools, uh, even at home, that um, I think we had over 500 activities. I'm looking at my colleagues at the end here. So really quite impressive. Um, just wanted to give you one other um, just interesting statistic that Lieutenant Governor was talking about um, really trying to get more women and minorities into STEM. And I had an inquiry come across my desk that I sent over to research by someone wanting to know, geez, how many uh, females did we graduate in STEM uh, this year? So I have the figures like hot off the press. Um, so for our UMass system, um, there were 35 percent of males in the UMass system graduated with a STEM degree this past year to only 20 percent of females. And for our state university system, it was 20 percent for males and 12 percent for females. And we know that more uh, women are in higher education population-wise than men. So it's really a number that we need to shift and change and all the work that you're doing is going towards that. So now I'm going to turn my attention to the panel. Um, we have three questions, and then if we wrap it up quick and we'll try to, um, we'll try to get good information out in a concise period of time, we'll turn over to, uh, our attention to all of you and questions that you might have. 
But the first question I have for each of them, and we're going to start um, with Bob LePage, and they'll each introduce themselves as they begin. So I will have them introduce themselves, give their name, organization, and title, and then briefly describe how their organization um, uh, with which they are affiliated supported STEM endeavors or STEM week. So, Bob? So, whoa. <laughs> that one wow. work, but this one does. <laughs> Wow, okay. Uh, so I'm going to be supporting by buying everybody hearing repair kits, I think. Uh, Bob Page, Assistant Secretary, Executive Office of Education, and our role in STEM Week was really to facilitate the support of planning to really recognize the work, as Lieutenant Governor mentioned. Uh, I personally had the opportunity of probably about a thousand miles in my car that week all over. Um, and multiple visits here down to this region, but in particular the opportunity to um, tour with middle schools as part of a, really a flow of students through Attleboro High School and let them see what their future and how they could gain applied learning skills in the STEM subjects. As um, I also always take the opportunity to meet the high school students who really did an incredible job of mentoring those students for the day and I think inspiring them and seeing other students. Um, I also had the opportunity, I saw President Cox in the back for a little bit, of attending uh, a great session on the Cape where we toured uh, the Woods Hole Institute and talked about collaborative projects with them and internships. Um, and talked about the Cape in general. So I got a lot of STEM week. I um, had the opportunity to attend the governor's briefing at Northeastern when he announced to the world that we were going to triple it for next year. Um, I then went home and took a long nap. Um, but really, again, I would just thank everybody for the work you did. It's really amazing with a little bit of recognition how fast people uh, wanted to celebrate the work. So congratulations to all of you. Thank you, Bob. And our next guest. Erin? Hi. Yeah. Um, I'm Erin Hashimoto Martell. I'm the Director of Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, so as you probably know there, um, out of uh, the department we write um, and have the standards around the different content areas and areas and then the related and um, MCAS assessments and where I work uh, in the department is the Center for Instructional Support which is kind of all that's between that so um, our work really focuses on providing guidance and resources to schools teachers and administrators around how to implement the standards and um, pieces like that. Regarding STEM and STEM week, uh, we were, uh, we were in a supportive role in really trying to connect with a lot of um, and promote a lot of the K-12 schools and things that were going on. What was great about the opportunity to have the STEM week was to give this spotlight on some really great things that were already happening um, across the Commonwealth that a lot of people just didn't know about. Um, so it was a really neat opportunity for people to get that recognition of really um, innovative things that were happening. Um, hopefully it was also an opportunity to establish new partnerships um, and really generate some new uh, organizations and schools coming together and trying something new. Um, and hopefully it spurred on some of that. Um, because in general, the hope is that it's not just one week, um, and it's not just about um, kind of the show, but it's really about planting seeds and launching the initiative around year-long engagement with STEM and also lifelong, right? So thinking of all the way down to early childhood and what sorts of opportunities they're getting in um, preschool and elementary school, um, all the way up through high school, post-secondary, um, 
careers and just as being good citizens um, requires having some um, STEM literacy and understanding what's going on around them. Um, yeah, that's great. No, thank you, Erin. Um, and uh, you, you, yours is perfect because it leads right into Scott, who's at a secondary uh, 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 secondary school and can talk about how his school supports STEM education. All right, so this one works. I think it's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, Scott Brown is a seventh fall science coordinator in Silver Lake, which is at, up in Kingston, Massachusetts. Um, and I think one of the things I think of on how my school helps support STEM education is uh, I came here for five years ago to the school and, and probably brought some, some new ways of thinking that I thought of as new ways of thinking of teaching, just trying something new every day. And I, I met a group of teachers who uh, were also very much involved in, in thinking of new ways to do things. And one of the first things we did is three years ago, we started an independent study at the uh, high school level with uh, one of our senior teachers. And it was one student. And now this year, we have 12 students uh, doing a variety of projects from chemistry, biology, engineering, and robotics. Uh, and we're looking at trying to develop a course around that. So engaging students in, in an authentic you know, research-based uh, opportunity in the high school. Uh, and, and looking further down the road, we said, well, it's not just the high school kids that, that need to be impacted by this. It's, it's K-12. So we, we opened up an opportunity to bring Project Lead the Way to our middle school. We had it at our high school. Um, we decided to bring it to the middle school. We got the grant. We brought two classes in. We actually added in an additional tech engineering teacher so we could broaden out the impact uh, in terms of student number of students who were being taught in, in the tech engineering field as well as making more connections to science. We then brought the project lead the way down to the elementary school and we're working closely with the coordinator down there to guarantee that students are involved in, in a uh, process of doing science or doing tech engineering work, which, which they are doing. And so one of the things we showcased at our STEM week this, this year was the fact that it was a K-12 comprehensive experience for these kids and that, that all kids are involved in it. And I know my superintendent who's, who's here has been very supportive of the work that we're doing and, and has, has STEM as a goal for herself as well and is a way to move the district forward. Perfect. Thanks, Scott. And your work, of course, uh, eventually leads your students to the great employers that Alexia will uh, tell us about and how they support STEM education as well. Hi, everyone. My name is Alexia Taxiarcos. I am the Senior Director of Global Communications at Sinzaba Technologies, which means I basically um, run internal and external communications. But my passion project, why I'm here today, and really the focus is I'm president of our Sonata Foundation. So we launched our own um, 5013C Foundation last year, and we thought it was really important to think about what makes Sonata great. So we've been in Attleboro for over 100 years. We engineer some of the, you know, what we call mission critical pro um, processing of applications. So when things can't fail, that's when our customers come to us. So we thought that what better way to be giving back to our communities and through STEM, right? STEM has given our engineers the ability to support their families, have great careers, have longevity. So for us, STEM is really critical. So when we, you know, when we launched our foundation last year, STEM was obviously what we wanted to focus on. And like the um, governor said, it really is about uh, female representation, minority representation, and making sure that there are certain demographics that are not have the same access as others, making sure we really think about those opportunities. So um, when we thought about this STEM week and how we can get involved, we thought, you know, what a great way to bring our engineers, bring our talent. I'm so glad to see Val the data here. So she was really one of the key leaders of it. Jennifer Brenner, who's in the room, was one of the key leaders of it. You know, the team came together and really kind of threw a grassroots effort thought about different ways that we can build different stations that tie to what we do in Saga. So engineering, um, process optimization, measurements, those are things that students from kindergarten all the way through 12 years of age can come and engage. And I had the opportunity to come and I brought my 10-year-old son and we went through all these different stations. We had over 100 people come in. And it was just really fascinating for people, for, for me, just to engage with people that came in. They were like, oh, you've been here? How long have you guys been here? I'm like, oh, more than 100 years. <laughs> <laughs> it, I think it's just a way that, you know, we, I think it was it, it, important for us to really kind of take a step back and say, it's our, it's our duty as um, a large employer, and it's 
our duty to be corporate citizens and continue to do more and more of these opportunities to have that gateway open to more and more students. So that's how we support STEM Week. We think that we completely agree. It's STEM Week is a week. It, it really is um, a year-long commitment. It, it's not something that um, you can just do once and kind of be done. There are two parts of what we focus on. We focus on community and STEM through our foundation, and we think both are really important. I think it's easier to have these quicker wins on the community side because our teams come together, we gave 2,000 hours of service, and we clean up, I don't know, how many acres and lots, and, and it's easier, right? Not, not that anyone is better, we believe both, but I think it's that sustained commitment to really help impact the future. Why no, good. <laughs> she saw me move in. That's the signal. Right. Um, and it's good to hear that STEM Week actually provided that exposure and that awareness that your company was there for 100 years and there were some neighbors and folks in that area that didn't even know about your company and the work that it did. Um, so our next special guest is actually a student. Um, I'd love her to introduce herself, um, let us know what grade you're in, and then just your question is just a little bit different. Um, Audrey, if you could briefly describe your involvement in in-school and out-of-school STEM programs that have been helpful to you in learning STEM concepts and exploring STEM careers. Uh, well, hi, I'm Audrey Sears. I'm a high school student in Alvaro, and I first got involved with STEM at Alvaro High School, which is a That's great. Thank you, Audrey. So um, I will go, we'll turn to our second question. We'll start back with Bob. And Bob, I know you attended some STEM Week activities, and I think we'd love to know um, how effective you found um, uh, the activities you attended and um, how you find it supports the mission of, of higher education and education across the spectrum. Well, certainly I think the whole week supported the mission, uh, which really, is about providing students the opportunities here in the Commonwealth that Lieutenant Governor pointed to. And the real opportunity, I think, was really planting those seeds. And I certainly saw light bulbs go on for students. And you see hundreds of students being exposed in a week. Um, up in Salem, they had, at Salem State University, they had kind of a quad full of projects like tonight, students walking through and robotics and drones. It was amazing to see students literally walk away with two things. One, in many of those cases, some of those students had never been to a college campus. And just by going to that college campus or coming to this college campus for the first time, it makes it much more likely there will be a second time. And I can tell you as a former professor the number of stories of people who had a hard time just getting from a community college parking lot in the front door. But when they know there's a purpose and they understand there's employers who are interested in hiring them and giving them an opportunity, if they're prepared, it changes people's lives and communities. And that's what I really appreciated was going around and seeing all those younger students and the relationships you could see them building with high school or college students and the businesses who were participating and certainly the number of businesses participating who have already indicated they're interested in participating next year. Um, so I think the real value is building awareness and the, the number of high quality jobs just because of the aging population, people like me who hope to retire someday Although I'm an eight-year-old and eleven-year-old, I'm not sure that's going to happen. 
you know, the opportunities are really strong for students who seek ca careers in STEM because not only are they going to be able to enter the workforce, they're going to be able to advance very quickly. Um, so it really was a tremendous week, yeah. and I, you know, I think what we have to do is continue to find ways to celebrate STEM. Mm -hmm. And you know, I appreciate you speaking about the interconnectedness of it all. I mean, I think part of the magic of the regional STEM networks is, in fact, that it's not just all higher ed out in the off, uh, audience or all K through 12 or all businesses, but it's all of us together knowing that it truly is a pipeline and we all have to work together. And we have to know what each other is doing in their own segments to be successful at it. So I appreciate that, Bob. Um, Aaron, if you want to speak to that as well and um, how, what, what experiences that you attended uh, that you, were, you thought were effective in supporting the mission of, of DESE, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education? Sure. Um, so we really believe that uh, STEM education um, incorporates both uh, deep content knowledge of each of the disciplines and um, a facility and understanding how they all connect and um, work together in order to um, solve whatever problem or phenomena that is presented. And so what I saw uh, between myself and my team, we tried to fan out to get to see a lot of different uh, events happening all over the state. Um, I was able to get into um, a handful of classrooms at Weymouth High School, which was really exciting to see. Um, I was in schools in Boston. Uh, there was a couple statewide um, administrator uh, conference events happening that week. Um, people my, from my team attended some library events where they hold after school STEM programs. Um, we, someone went to go see uh, there, a bunch of schools who did the I2 learning um, curriculum and on the last day they have a big kind of community opening event where people can go see the kind of culminating projects students came up with. So we tried to see a bunch of things and I think what um, was really exciting to see was just that when people think of STEM um, and they do STEM activities, it usually means that students are being actively engaged in hands-on learning. Um, we didn't go anywhere and go and see students being talked at the whole time, or we weren't invited to something where we went and students were just reading about STEM. Everything we saw was exciting and engaging students and actually doing some sort of STEM um, learning in a very active, hands-on way. Um, so in that way, it was really good to see how people um, when they think of STEM, they do think of that type of learning, uh, which um, really serves uh, a piece of engagement for students. Um, it really raises students' interest, um, and it really helps to push students to tackle problems, think at a deeper level, think on a more complex level than when they're presented with much more flat um, kind of teaching and learning activities. Um, so in that way, it was really exciting to see. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, oh, great. Thank you, Aaron. I mean, Scott, where you're in a school, and I, and I know that you uh, led some activities, could you talk about the impact that you saw on students, on parents, on colleagues, perhaps? Sure. And maybe what we could even do better for next year. So at the end of the last school year, we put on a little STEM exposition at our school to sort of showcase the final projects and the STEM week came up this year and I decided well, why don't we do the same thing although we don't have end projects so let's, let's showcase everything that's happening and, and as it's ongoing because again the same it isn't a defined moment or a week it's ongoing I, I couldn't wrap my head that quickly around something so I said let's do an exposition K-12 uh, so just a showcase nothing formal and we set up in our we have an event entrance which is fairly large and we've now outgrown that uh, but I think the biggest impact uh, what I was looking for as a goal from it was, can I really show the community what's happening in the school? How, how are we educating their kids? The communities don't come into schools. School committees don't come into schools. They should. They don't. And that's not a good or a bad thing, but it's the reality. So I have to do something to really put it out there. So I'm constantly putting stuff in the paper, constantly taking pictures of the kids, and tweeting out whatever I can, although I'm horrible at social media. 
this was an opportunity to bring the parents and the community members in, but also bring the students in. And I didn't realize the impact it would have on the, the fellow students until uh, afterwards, getting word back. So we started at midday at 12.30 and ran until 5.30 at night. And then we, I offered it up to middle school students to come by. And the middle school students were part of it, but other middle school students came. And then I got back and saw the teachers a couple of days later, and they said, we should have brought more kids. We should have brought every kid. The kids were going nuts. They couldn't believe what they saw, what the high school kids were doing. They didn't even really know what their, their peers were doing. And so that impact of this is, these are the opportunities available for me. This is how I'm going to be involved in education in the future. I'm excited. I'm, I'm bought in again. I, I didn't think it was going to be that cool, but really, I can do that when I'm a junior or a senior or a sophomore. I'm, I'm hooked. Okay, I'm not going to leave you as long as I have that opportunity available to me. And then the elementary school students who we had come in as well got the same sense. And we didn't have as many of them, but we had some. And in fact, I'm in a neighboring town, and my two kids were asking me, when are we doing STEM night, Dad? And so I had to bring them again to, to my school, and they were excited talking to people. So one of the biggest impacts, I think, was just internal. And even, even the seniors, as they were changing classes and walking through this exposition, or not seeing the whole 9, 12 group, they, they would stop. And to the chagrin of the administration, because we had a lot of late kids to classes, they would sit and hang out and talk with their peers. They didn't even realize what their peers were doing. They didn't understand that there was a computer science activity going on. Like They didn't understand that there was a, an engineering activity happening in a room. And so it opened up to the, the, their peers what was happening. So I think most kids or parents know we're doing STEM, but they don't really know what we're doing. And it was an opportunity to show them and get hands on and to see the projects and to talk to the kids and understand that the kids really are really doing well by it and they really understand what's happening. So I, I think that outreach, that community outreach, and even the outreach just within the school is really helpful to advance us, to push us forward a little bit. Yeah, that's great. And I, I appreciate what you say about social media. I, I empathize. I, um, when I first heard the term, I thought it was getting together like TV journalists and other media print folks and just socializing. So it's just yeah. really, all right, that was bad. We'll go on. <laughs> um, Alexa, um, I'm going to switch your question around a little bit. Um, you, you did already talk to how STEM Week actually did um, bring awareness to your company. Um, have you thought of ways you can leverage uh, that kind of exposure, that kind of awareness that STEM Week brings to kind of enhance what you're doing in your company and enhance the pipeline um, that we're developing here in Massachusetts? Yes, I think I just want to kind of add a little bit something to the first part of the question that we can um, fully flesh out. Sure. So I think that you know, what we saw was that we had obviously um, students from Idlebrook come, um, had students from neighboring towns, we had employees and their children come. We also had employees, children's friends that came, right? And I think that it really helped um, make those parents seem really cool. And engineers, I'm sorry, aren't inherently cool. <laughs> but to those kids, there was such a huge sense of pride into what their parents did. And in their cir circles, to have that perception was you know a pleasant byproduct. It wasn't the intent. The intent is obviously to spread some awareness and all of that makes possible. But I think you know creating, demystifying that, and creating that it's accessible and that it's interesting, and that you don't have to be an astrophysicist at five to get involved in this. I think that was really impactful. So um, back to your question. Um, mm -hmm. What can businesses do to help further this? Mm -hmm. I think it's you know being being open and being you know interested in these opportunities. I will say that you know, we had to have our event on a Sunday afternoon, and it, we were on the scheduling call trying to figure out how do we do it, what day of the week, you know when, when, when can we fit this in? Students are busy all during the school day. Do we want to do it at night? When did the you know, Patriots play? Is it on the home? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're in Adelros, we have to think about all these things, right? Oh, it's Halloween, how do we, or do we incorporate that? There was all these issues, right? So for us, I think it's important to have um, clear visibility onto you know, when Week 2019 is. We're already rolling out our calendar for the foundation and all of our corporate philanthropy initiatives and um, focus areas 419. I think that was really helpful. Um, and I also think it's, you know, 
just being open, right? Businesses need to be open to educators. Businesses need to be open to the Department of Education and to all other businesses and you know colleges. We have a really great partnership with several community colleges to think about how we can partner together. Because at the end of the day, you know our first job is really to serve our customers, right? So everything that we do for the community, uh, you know, does sometimes take a backseat. Not that it's any less important, but we do have to run a viable business first. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, and Audrey, um, could you tell us how your experience um, at programs held at the college campus and at businesses with STEM professionals enabled you to explore STEM college and career pathways? So at the Sensata After School program, um, we would meet every month for like a session I forget how many hours, but um, we would be focused on learning something new, and usually, like, people would come in and teach us about this, and they would say, oh, I didn't get to this kind of science or this kind of math until um, late high school or even college. So this kind of exposure has definitely helped open eyes of what it could mean my peers that went through the programs and, like, um, definitely made us invest into the type of careers that we want to go into. Um, it's really valuable as uh, a student to be able to have someone to go to, like if you have questions, or do you, even if you're just curious. So mm. I guess the experience is very good. No, I appreciate that, and we heard from the Lieutenant Governor the value in internships and externships, uh, mentorships, etc. cetera. Um, so hearing you validate that is actually quite nice. Yeah, we have a third question, but I kind of would like to shake it up a little and um, interject our third question first with any questions that you all might have, knowing that we have government represented here, business, education, and, and a student. Um, is there something that's come up for you already or things that you have experienced um, either during STEM week or any time of the year that um, you'd like to raise in this important group of people? Yeah. yeah. Probably more of a comment than a question, but I was happy. Oh, you know what? And we have a mic, which is great. Thanks, Stacy. Thank you. There'll be a pay raise. Probably there. more of a comment than a question, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, I uh, do a lot of early childhood, uh, early STEM, and uh, I was happy to hear you mention about preschool. and. Uh, you know, those, I've been in early childhood for over 40 years, and we've known about the brain development in those first five years, but now that we have scientists at Harvard confirming that, <laughs> now more people are getting on the bandwagon. And um, I think it's just important to include, um, you know, that age group into our conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, we do early STEM at the Children's Museum in Greater Fall River on a daily basis. And um, we see we're educating parents. We do something called kitchen science and help parents understand that you don't have to go out and buy a hundred dollar kit. That baking soda and vinegar is a good way to start with volcanoes and so forth. And helping parents understand some of what they're doing you know, is contributing to the STEM education of young children. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? two hands. I can do one in each. Oh, okay. <laughs> and we pay a good Thank money you. for this. We want to, you know. <laughs> what kind of resources are available for schools to access in regards to the standards um, through uh, the Department of Education? So I, I think there's probably two parts to that question. Um, the first part is the example of planning or implementation grants. Um, this year we are funding, as we have the last two years, um, just over a million dollars in professional development and small micro grants, probably like um, Silver Lake uh, received. Those are five to $20,000 grants. They're available through Project Lead the Way for curriculum and professional development. Uh, the other way that we have 
this year provided resources with professional development in computer science, about 100-ish teachers. I say 100-ish because I know it's more, but I don't remember the exact number, which is a little embarrassing. So I'm supposed to know that number. <laughs> um, and uh, the last part is technology grants that I think you heard Lieutenant Governor uh, mention. We routinely put out what are called skills capital grants. I know some of the schools here have applied and received grants. Um, those grants are usually between fifty thousand and four hundred and ninety-nine, nine ninety-nine, ninety-nine cents. <laughs> That way it doesn't have to go through the controller's office, <laughs> which is a lot of paperwork for you. Um, and those are available both to um, school districts as well as community colleges and higher ed institutions. We will conclude this year's funding in the next week or two, about $15 million, and we will open up 12 to $15 million in funding in the next week-ish. If we're curing, we can't give you a date, but the next week or two. Um, those are ways that we're trying to invest research, but we also invest in the great work that people do with frameworks and keeping those current. Um, we here in the, the Commonwealth take that for granted, but I can tell you as you talk to other states and they ask, why are you number one in science? Why are you number one in math? It's, we have great people, great communities, passionate about education, and we have tremendous people at DESE who engage with industry and communities and ask people to invest their time and resources to create great standards. And those standards drive the dialogue of being prepared. So a lot of different ways. Um, there are certainly always ongoing little grants or micro grants and some larger grants. So I'll add that in addition to, you said resources broadly, so resources often known as money, um, which is great, but also we offer um, from the department, um, from the Center for Instructional Support, we have, um, we run various statewide networks for educators and each year, um, usually around the summer, we'll put out our kind of catalog and um, schools and districts can opt in if they want to. So this year we're actually running a um, STEM integration in elementary schools network. Um, so they meet over a series of meetings over the course of the year and with our support. Um, uh, there's teams from elementary schools. Um, we start with elementary because we feel like it's such a great place to promote integration because typically you have one teacher that's teaching both um, all the different subjects. So we just wanted to help provide some guidance and support around how they might take their math standards and they might take their science standards and how they actually talk to each other um, in a really um, authentic way, um, especially when um, at the elementary uh, schedule, a lot of times we hear um, kids not getting access to science at all. Um, and the number one reason they say is that they don't have time. Um, so we're trying to be really thoughtful around how we can um, just nudge them around um, how they can, uh, if they do STEM integration, they can actually hit both science and math standards. Um, and in addition, I guess I'll take this moment with the people in the room to say that um, any, um, any way we can get more um, than just teachers saying, I need time for science, whenever we can get business partners and community organizations and families um, also putting pressure on schools and saying, why isn't my kid, why isn't our kids, um, why aren't they getting access to um, STEM learning, to science learning? Um, it just puts added pressure and added um, emphasis on why it's important, um, particularly um, at the early grades. And you know, um, this, what you both said kind of leads in, for me, to the last question. And Bob, I was thinking as you were talking about STEM works, and I wondered if you could talk about that to this group. But then I'll also ask the question that all five of you can think about. And so the last question was, what do you see as the value of business educator partnerships in advancing STEM education and preparing students for the 21st century workplace? And I didn't know if folks knew about STEM works or not. So I think the value is very straightforward in that from a, a business's perspective, there's two elements, and I think the panel members hit on it. Here in the Commonwealth, the majority of our companies are small and mid-sized companies. And if you want to be successful in finding talent, then people need to know about you. And 
when I was out in Western Mass at one of their STEM conferences or group meetings, somebody came in and I heard a parent say, well, I'm not sure about engineering and manufacturing. I'm not sure there's really a lot going on in my region. And I put my head down and I tried to resist, but then I had to say to them, there's 700 companies in Hamden, Hampshire, and Franklin County. They employ 24,000 people in advanced manufacturing. They make everything from robots to auto parts to vacuum parts to healthcare high-end equipment. You just don't know them. You don't. You drive by them and you see a sign and you don't know what they do. So for industry, the value is to build awareness of the opportunities of the cool parents who work inside them. <laughs> That's the value. And I think to get them to participate is you have to invite them. And I'm going to give a quick story, humbling story, from a couple of weeks ago at the STEM Summit. I was walking around the showcase very much like yours tonight, and I saw a table very similar to this, and it was half of one organization and half of the other organization. And one of the organizations, I'm sure they won't be offended me telling the story, I should probably have checked, but I'm going to do it anyways. Because it's really most embarrassing about me was a company called Bose. Everybody know what Bose is? Pretty well known, right? And I, so I walked around three times and I looked and said, why does Bose have like a half a table? That's a pretty big company. I see the commercials. <laughs> so I think they thought I was stalking them. <laughs> I went over and there was a woman working there, Michelle. And I said, well, tell me why Bose is here. And she said, we want to start an internship program and we figured this was a place to show up. And so we talked to some other people, and they said they would allow us to split their table in half. And I said, Bose, pretty big, huh? No internship program. No, nope, never had an internship program. Have a hard time finding people. And I said, well, what schools do you work with? She looked at me and said, not really any. Now, this is the embarrassing part, my embarrassing part. I said, I used to know a guy, I think he works at Bose. His name is Don. And then I gave the last name. And she looked at him and she said, yeah, I've known him. I said, well, I used to know Don. Does he still work there? And she looked at me and started tapping. She said, yeah, he, he still works there. She said, how do you know him? I said, oh, I went to high school with him. and I." I see him around once in a while, but I haven't talked to him. I don't talk to him that much. And she said, would you have a cell phone number? I said, sure. I got his number. And she said, well, call him. So he came walking over, and she realized I didn't know him because I went to high school with him. I said, Don, so what do you do at Bose? And he said, I'm the vice president of global human resources. <laughs> wow. And I'm the one who convinced some people I know to give them the internship. I said, Don, we need to get together on this. It's great to see you here. And then I put my head down and almost cried because I live in Western Mass and I commute to Boston every morning. Don lives two houses down from me. Wow. I often see him outside cutting his lawn, giving him the wave. How's it going, Don? Great, Bob. It's going good. And we never got together. That shows you that you have to talk to people, which you all know you're doing it. But you have to invite them to participate. Companies, like you heard here, they're in the business of running their business. They're not educators. They don't want to be educators. What they want is you, as community organizers and educators, to help figure out this town's solution. And the only way you get there is by inviting them. And they don't say yes the first time, and maybe not the second time, but you have to keep inviting them. And don't think 
they're not participating because they don't want to. Very often, they don't know how to. So that humbling experience is leading to a discussion with Bose, but there are many companies like that. And the smaller and mid-sized companies have the biggest challenge of finding talent, and those are the people in your community you need to get with. Thank you, uh, that's, that's incredible, Bob, I appreciate that. And Scott and Alexa, as, as they're talking, I'm thinking, have you been successful in that area of making connections as a school with businesses and as business with school? And could you tell us, as an audience who's always craving to make those connections, how you've gone about it? So I, think, so I think there's two ways that we really think about this. So from a foundation perspective, it's kind of like church and state, right? Even though it shouldn't be the kind of this. So from, from a foundation perspective, we want to make sure that we're kind of um, focused on needs-based, STEM-focused support. So we give out grants, we develop um, organic programs, we support organizations that focus on STEM. We try not to um, put more of our focus on high school, college age STEM work because we want to be very clear about we're not trying to develop our future workforce so we can kind of take them from this side and then bring them in-house. Right? We want to make sure that we're kind of agnostic about those two fronts. And that's just a decision that we made kind of like from the very beginning. So that's from, that's from our corporate philanthropy. From our company-wise, like, yes, we think it's really important. We think that workforce development is a huge thing that we need to do as, as inside of technologies. We think that the way people work is changing. Um, the skills that we need are changing. We're not readily finding the skills that we need. There are some open job recs that we have for 300 days, 400 days, we're not finding the talent that we need, and that's a huge, it's a challenge to our business. So working with um, education, I think, is critically important. Working with, um, you know, you as a conduit to this huge talent pool, I think it's really important. I also think that it's on, and I'm not going to push it back, but I do think that companies need to start rethinking about talent, right? So if you don't have you know, your bachelor's degree, does that mean that we don't look at you? For most jobs, you don't, right? Is that the right way? Um, no, <laughs> right? So I think it's, we, we really need to kind of engage in more of a dialogue of, of what that means and what those, um, the, the skills that are needed that might come with a workforce that doesn't have those traditional degrees. So I, you know, I'm not here to say that we've had this figured out. We don't. I think you're absolutely right that you know we know that there's a shortage. We know that there's lots of people that are talented, willing, want to be part of this purpose-driven workforce that we have. So I think we just need to figure it out. Mm, thanks. Scott, did you want to so I'll have to be honest, although I've been in the position five years, I think I think we're in the infancy of, of developing strong relationships and partnerships and a lot of stories inspired me to reach out to a company in one of our towns, uh, which I'll explain later. But I, one of the things we have been successful at is that we, we, we've done a better job of showcasing or at least involving our students in a lot of these STEM activities. And in the parents in our community who are also part of that at, at workforce today, I mean, when, and like Bob said, no area is, is immune to having STEM um, companies or workforce. I wouldn't say we're rich in it. We have them. We haven't identified them. But we definitely have a ton of parents and, and community members who work in that industry. I mean, we're a bedroom, basically, community of, of Boston. So we have a lot of commuters come down. So we have doctors, and we have nurses, and we have engineers, and we have biomedical people. And we have a ton of them. Uh, and so we've done a lot of work that way. Our, our middle school robotics club, uh, one of the parents, he's an engineer, does uh, electrical distribution, um, gave us a big grant himself. His company comes in, he comes in and talks to the kids. We had a parent who works for Eversource, said, I'd be happy to bring the truck in and talk to the kids about what we do and show them how we repair power lines and all my tools. Uh, we, we have other parents that we've connected with 
who are in the field, but I think we need to, to, to launch to the next step. And so we have a huge distribution plant for Cisco in our little town of Clinton. So the like, distribution plant's like half the size of the town. And, and I've never reached out to them. And not that I don't want to, but again, like that's just all, all up and, and ask them how they would, can we collaborate? And I, I feel like with science education where it is today, and I know our, our, our representatives from our offices here and, and others will agree that it's, it's complex, there's a lot going on. I just remember when I started in the mid-90s, uh, and, and when I was educated in science, you really could be educated in a science classroom, go off to a college and go off to a job and apply some skills and, and feel like you're pretty competent. And you just can't do that anymore. Uh, it's, it's near impossible. It's near impossible for me to cover material like I, like I used to be covered, I teach one class of anatomy now, and I just like, well, what do I, where do I stop with a given topic? I could just go deeper and deeper and deeper and never get to something else. So we, we're trying to reel back that content and that application, and how can the kids be involved in doing science? Because a lot of it they can they can find out from their on their own. But at the same time, that puts a that puts a pressure on me as a science educator to stay relevant, and I'll try my best, but I can't. Uh, I'm not in that field as much as a lot of people. So I look at business and industry as is, is doing two things for us. One, bringing expertise in. So business and industry providing expertise either in the classroom to come in or for us to go to see them to get that expertise. What's, what's, what's current? You know it, your business wouldn't be successful if you weren't current. I could be outdated and kids really don't know any different. Well, I don't want to be that person. So I need that relationship to help me because it's, it's one of the easiest ways to get it. But the side of it is, and it's one of the things that's in our standards that Aaron will test to, uh, relevance, rigor, and coherence. Well, I'm going to be relevant if business is helping me be relevant because guess what? Kids, we're doing this in class and then go oh, look, we're going to go toward business and look, business is actually doing it in business. And they're applying this. And it may not be exactly the same, but there's a connection. And now kids have a better connection to what they're learning, but a stronger connection to why they're learning and want to have a better buy into school because they see the relevance to that. And that, that's where I come at it from a relevant standpoint. And, and, and one of my teachers is here who, who does the independent study at the high school. And, and it's the same thing. It's a very relevant experience the kids are getting. And they can see where it applies. And we've actually had businesses see some of the projects the kids do and say, we would, we would love to have you come with us and work mm -hmm. with us. And I think if we're doing that, then we're being successful. But there, there has to be that partnership. So mm -hmm. I'm going to call Cisco um, because I'm inspired. Because I could have swore, I would have said up wholeheartedly, both has internships. Why are you doing it Cisco? Because they call me. That's fantastic and great insights. I appreciate all that. I can see why Catherine invited you guys up as panelists. Um, we have five minutes. A couple more questions. We'd love to hear from you. Don't be shy. Um, and we have a mic, just so that people in back can hear you as well. Anybody else? How about in the back? We haven't heard from you guys. You don't want the front out, do you? I love that. Yeah. Are there students here? Good thinking. <laughs> And did everyone hear the question? Could you, could you repeat it, Scott? It, what is the steps you could take or 
to get a school more involved in, in STEM. I, I, there has to be, I think there has to be some driving force behind it. We have to identify somebody who can, who can take that leadership role or at least gather a group together to say that this is important and make that known. And, and not that, well, we just have to do it because we have to do it because there's a need for it. Nobody's going to listen to you. And the laws are the law, but people still break them. It's that this is important because it's going to be good for the kids. And when I came on, I always told my teachers, every decision I make that we all make, it's got to be for the kids. It's not about us. It's about them. So are we going to put something together that's going to be impactful for students? And I think the data is out there that STEM is impactful for them, that, that it really engages them in a, in a thoughtful process. It's not just good for STEM. It's good for, for educating a child today. And so in that, in developing a strong STEM program, which I think can also be you know, cross-curricular a lot of times. It doesn't just have to be science. It can be, it can be writing, it can be historical. It can be a lot of things, and they, they run out to STEAM, and some of the acronyms are going to be all confabulated, and nobody will know what it means because it will contain everything. But finding somebody who, who can take that lead and, and make that the case that this is important and how it's going to impact students, and I think I, I brought that in I think we've shown how impactful this is for students, and then we've sort of, that momentum has built. You just gotta find that, that core group and bring it forward. And if it comes from the students, that's, again, there's, there's no hold hard when it comes from you, because you're the one that's gonna benefit from it. So if you get a group of students that understands the importance and brings it forward, that, that's gonna drive it a million miles. So go for it. <laughs> And so, how perfect to end on a student interest question and an evening of sharing about um, what's amazing about STEM and STEM education and STEM careers, every, something that we're all involved in. And so I want to thank our panelists for their perspective and their expertise and to all of you for being part of this.